Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, oops, excuse me. My <laughs> anyway, good morning. Um, today it is our great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Panos Papanastiu Nasu from uh, University of Cyprus. Um, uh, uh, that going to share one of his uh, most favorite topic, which is the plastic deformation. Uh, Panos, uh, uh, Panos' name actually very often associated with plasticity. So I'm so glad that today, Panos, you uh, sh uh, share this with us. Um, before the meeting, as I mentioned, um, all of you are actually familiar with as well. Uh, the rule of those, uh, there is no rule or <laughs> rope talk, it's carol technical talk. Um, but we basically ask you uh, um, not uh, recording or, or, or taking picture or anything. And, uh, but over the past, nearly all the press tensors are waiting to release their recording. So it's today. So Professor uh, Papanastu uh, kindly offering this uh, uh, video recording so that uh, you can catch up. And I will release the link as well as uh, uh, downloads after uh, the presentation, the newsletter. You already will release the newsletter in the weekend, just to pay attention to that. Um, before the meeting start, I think uh, we, we need to uh, uh, reflect on this safety, uh, this health, that uh, pandemic, um, in this new environment, if you will, how people adapt to this new environment. I have to say it takes toll. It takes toll regardless you are healthy or not, uh, mentally, physically, not only yourself, but also the people around us as well, uh, family members and kids and uh, grandparents um, and friends, of course. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we do that's the main reason we are doing rope talks is to keep people connected and entertained, if you will, uh, stimulated during this pandemic when everybody was uh, quarantined and staying at home. Um, so right now the situation in the U.S. is pretty severe, uh, especially in Houston, Texas. We, we become uh, most mentioned in the state in the CNN. <laughs> Not for the good part, but uh, um, the thing is that wearing mask, oh, not uh, uh, anything else, but uh, only for health reason. So everybody wear a mask for yourself, more for the people around you. That shows the responsibility. That shows the person that you care. Um, so we we will come out um, any pandemic in the history, people come out strong and become stronger. That's where, where we are. Um, we hope we put behind us this uh, worst period. And with the fun uh, we have in, in these rope talks, we come out actually technically and mentally stronger. Um, with that, let me briefly introduce uh, Panos, as many of you familiar with uh, him. And uh, uh, Panos, I have to say last time, when you showed the first uh, next slide, I was thinking, oh man. So 2002 was a year I met you actually, <laughs> when you were in uh, Cambridge Research Center with John Cook, uh, very nice settings. Mm -hmm. We had a very good lunch and uh, you, you provided me such a, I mean, far reaching uh, suggestions on plasticity modeling. I mean, I was the Eclipse developer for uh, simulations, reservoir simulations. So Panos is a professor now at the Department of Civil and the Environmental Engineering at the University of Cyprus. He is actually the founding head of the department and a dean of engineering school, a director of master in petroleum engineering program. Uh, Panos, of course, as you know, is uh, is graduated from Greece, from uh, uh, Athens, NTU, in 1984, and uh, he also 
is one of the University of Minnesota uh, graduates. Uh, in geomechanics world, actually, uh, it, it, the Minnesota is like the tag that uh, the couple is always be a fashion, if you will. It's actually the credo of the rock, U.S. rock mechanics. Um, he worked many years in industry uh, at Shenbushe, uh, various locations, and that's why he was greeting uh, Colin Sears and uh, all his uh, old friends. Uh, and he is currently working on many uh, geomechanics related um, uh, applications such as variable stability hydraulic factoring, and he is one well, of his favorite and CO2 uh, storage as well. Uh, with that, and uh, I think for the folks who want to ask a question, please type into the chat window. Uh, panels will address them after the presentation. Uh, if uh, I couldn't address all of them, uh, he will follow up with uh, emails as well. I will have his email address in my newsletter for you to contact him in case you have further questions. Uh, with that, I am going to leave the floor to uh, Professor uh, Panos Papadastu. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Gang Khan, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Andy, also for making available uh, the online infrastructure of your institution. I would like to thank you in particular and congratulate you for organizing uh, this uh, very successful uh, hydraulic fracturing rope uh, talk series. It is one of the positive things that came out of uh, the coronavirus crisis in our profession. And uh, to say that we learn and use the new tools for teaching online, uh, and for organizing exams and meetings very successfully. Within the worries, we had uh, positive things. We had uh, the chance to spend and enjoy more time with families. This crisis is a life experience, as Gang Han said before, and will come out strong. But uh, I wish to get back to normal very soon and see each other uh, in one of the forthcoming scientific meetings. Until then, all keep safe. Now, as you had seen from my affiliation, I am based in Cyprus. For those they don't, they do not know, Cyprus is the big island in the Eastern Mediterranean. It is an independent country member of the European Union. The main activities, the economy is based on, tour on tourism and services, but there is an ongoing exploration uh, activities in offshore deep water. And we had some uh, discovery of uh, three gas fields by the operators. The operators in the area is uh, Nobel, uh, Any Total, and ExxonMobil. Now you will see also in my affiliation, I listed Schlumberger Cambridge Research, and uh, you will see next in the acknowledgement of the support and people I work with them. This is basically, I started working on hydraulic frank actioning in, in Schlumberger Cambridge Research in 91. I had collaboration with uh, people uh, well known in the industry in petroleum geomechanics and hydraulic fracturing. I mentioned first uh, Mark Tirzele. He was a very uh, good man and uh, a great scientist. Unfortunately, he died young 10 years ago. I will always remember and acknowledge the contribution of Mark Trissel to my work. 
I worked also with Emmanuel Deturne, Jean de Roche at that time, and later with, uh, sorry, just a moment, please, uh, to find the laser. Okay, I will get. And later I worked with Colin Atkinson, Osama Ali, the Galmodel, which I will show. At that time, we had a good collaboration with the group of Charles de Pater in Delft University as well. I moved to Cyprus in 2002. I had some support on the hydraulic fracturing from the Cyprus Research Promotion Foundation. And I worked on uh, related problems, smaller problems with people in Greece, Euripides, Papamikos, and Sindef in Norway. Those were smaller projects. And currently, I have uh, funding from European Regional Development Fund and the Republic of Cyprus, and some new collaborations uh, here. So, I will focus on hydraulic fracturing in weak rocks. And uh, I have the applications and issues here. Of course, the main application is to stimulate oil and gas reservoirs. It can be used to reject in shallower formations, softer formations. But this work is particularly useful in the design of frac packs for sun control. The objective is to predict the pressures for hydraulic fracture in the fraction dimensions and containment. And in hydraulic fracturing shale reservoirs, it will be useful to have a kind of index for interval selections. And I will show one such index within this uh, program. In CO2 geological storage, we can relate this work to the risk of CO2 escape through hydraulic fractures and address also the problems of uh, well activity. We can improve well activity. And there are other related applications, sciences are common with uh, environmental engineering applications like waste disposals and cleanup of contaminated sites and in geotechnical engineering, many similarities with injection, injection of crowd and in dam constructions to avoid hydraulic fracturing. So I will, uh, uh, just to, to keep you, you are interested, I will make some claims like an attorney, and then I will try to prove those just to keep your interest. I will claim that in soft formation, we have high net pressure, shorter and wider fractures. We have high apparent or effective fracture toughness. This effective fracture toughness increases with propagation length, but in short reaches a limit value. This effective fracture toughness is greater when the fracture front propagates in the vertical direction upward and hence a fracture will propagate in the horizontal direction even in the absence of barrier layers. There is issue with the hydraulic fracture closure pattern and the interpretation of the mini frac and the determination of the closure stress on proband. And the last claim and brindleness index in hydraulic fracturing must be a combination of the rock strength with the situ stresses. So we started this work to answer the question of the high net pressures. This was a big issue in the oil industry back in the beginning of the 90s, how to explain the high net pressures. And some of the proposition was say that near the uh, fracture tip, there is a fluid lag. 
Therefore, we need higher pressures back at the wellbore to propagate the fractures. Then there was the addition that the rock dilation will enforce even larger fluid lags. This was uh, this was not true, actually, as I will show. There is, in the field, we may have high apparent fracture toughness due to the scale effect, the confining pressures, heterogeneity, heterogeneity, and plasticity. Or in the field, we may underestimate the closure stress. And if we underestimate the closure stress, then we will underestimate the propagation pressures. To answer all of these, uh, propositions, we set up a, a finite element model. Actually, it was quite advanced model with a modeling of high trolley fracturing in the fracture, allowing uh, the, for the formation of fluid lag. And uh, we look at also uh, the model was able to model plasticity in weak rocks near the fracture tip, due to high shear stresses, we, we may have the formation of these plastic zones as you can hear here. And, these, and if these plastic zones are formed, then the energy will dissipate that in this energy and not enough energy will reach the tip to split the rock. So that we will need higher pressure back at the well board. One can think also like that these tips, the shape of these plastic zones around the tip shifts the tip actually. Therefore, we need higher pressure to propagate the fractures. To answer all this, as I said, we set up an advanced elastoplastic, elastoplastic, elastoplastic fully coupled hydraulic, hydraulic fracturing model. We, flow, we model the fluid flow in the fracture, assuming Newtonian viscous fluid, lubrication theory. For the rock deformation, we allowed for more Coulomb flow theory of plasticity for yielding. And for fracture propagation to split the rock, we use a very advanced model. I, I think is the most advanced model for uh, non-linear fracture mechanics, which this model, the cohesive model, simulates the softening behavior of the rock when it is stressed before it splits. And we can simulate that. This was the fracture propagation criterion, but at the same time, I was uh, calculate the path independent J integral, the path independent J integral from which it was possible to calculate the effective fracture toughness during propagation. So the, the fracture was propagated based on the cohesive model, but the J integral was able to give us the elevated fracture toughness. Finite element analysis, fully coupled solutions, meshing, remeshing to do long propagations. And you can see in the pictures here, uh, the fracture profile is just a quarter of the fracture due to symmetry. It starts from here and it propagates. This is an elastoplastic solution. The fracture profiles as the fracture propagates. And I will show some comparison. With plasticity, we get wider fracture compared to elasticity. And if I go to the uh, pressure profile, we have wider fractures with plasticity. So with plasticity, the fluid front reach are closest to the peak, and we have all the pressure drop near the, uh, near the uh, a tip, as you can say here. And back at the well board, the pressures are quite close. Next, I will show the net pressure as the fracture propagates, the elasticity and plasticity. What we can see here with plasticity, actually, 
the net pressure increases at the beginning until the plastic zones are fully developed and the effective fracture toughness actually is fully developed at that point and then decreases like the elastic solution. And here we have with the effective or apparent toughness as we call it as a function of the fracture extension. It starts, increases the effective fracture toughness, but it reaches a kind of a limit value after some propagation steps. With elasticity, of course, the toughness remains constant. Now, how important is plasticity? It depends on the scale of the plastic zones. If the plastic zones are small, plasticity will not be important. So uh, we attempted to scale the plastic zone to see on which parameters will depend on. And of course, the first parameters we found, it's the deviator of the stresses. The difference between the stresses along the propagation direction minus the stress normal to the fractured leg. The closure stress is that, as you can see. It will depend also on the toughness of the material, the precise strength. This is a question from the classical fracture mechanics. But then from the analytic work we did at that time in Schlumberger Cambridge research and the very famous solution published, we can get this characteristic length, which includes the play strain modulus and the pumping parameters and the compressive strength of the rock. So overall, we could say we'll get luxury plastic zones if we have high uh, elastic modulus, high pumping rates, high original toughness, and low rock, rock strength. Basically, these parameters change the stress concentration near the tip and create larger plastic zones. So, and then I have computational results to show, to make the point. And you can see two examples. In the first example, we have some fixed parameters. And then we look at different cases. In the columns, we vary the rock strength. is the ratio of the compressive strength over the tensile strength in these one, two, three columns. So the third columns correspond to the weak rock, let's say the first to the combined rock. And in the rows below, we have the stress field. The first row corresponds to the isotropic stress field. That will be the case when the fracture front propagates horizontally, let's say. The third row corresponds to an isotropic stress field and that will correspond to the case when the fraction front propagates vertically. In that case, you see from the calculated effective fracture toughness, we have high effective fracture toughness when the fracture propagates vertically, when the fracture propagates vertically compared to the case when the fracture propagates horizontally. In the second example, what we varied, we, we kept the same rock strength ratio, compressive to the side, as you can see, and we vary the pumping parameters in the columns, the pumping parameters, and again, different stress field in the rows. Again, you can see here, of course, when we have high pumping rates, we get higher stress concentration and more plasticity. But this effective fracture toughness is particularly high when the stress field is anisotropic. That's the case when the front propagates vertically. And of course, to make the, to show you some results, I try, I found this experimental results published in this paper, Funatsu et al. in 2004, which in this paper, they measure, they measure 
the fracture toughness as a function of the confining pressure. And you can, he, you can see here the big increase in the fracture toughness as a function of the confining pressure. You, under zero confining, of course, it's here, and the under uh, confining pressure are now nine megapascal. They cut an increase in the fracture toughness by five times. And you still and you can see that the diagram shows that it will still increase for higher confining uh, pressures. And of course, it's uh, we know that we do hydraulic fracturing under high under confining pressures, under high confining pressures. So that justifies the elevated uh, effective fracture toughness that we found. Now I will uh, look at the fracture closure. So again, with the plasticity solution, we propagated the fracture and it reached that fracture profile, which I show here. You can see the last line. And then I will allow the fracture to close down. And this is the fracture profile. As the fracture closes, you can see that it closes quite a lot. Almost it covers the closure as the half of the volume without the without changing the fracture length. And then the fracture closes like a in a zip pattern, in a zip pattern. It closes first near the teeth, and then the closure lasts near the elbow. In the diagram here, I have the net pressure actually during propagation, which was like that, and then allow the fracture to close after it had reached five meters, like that. And I propagated the log, and I allow the fracture to close after it had reached eight meters. Again, you, you see a great pressure drop when we stop pumping without changing the fracture length. And then the pressure drops and the fracture close completely at the negative, at the negative net pressures. So if we interpret the closure stress from this point, we'll underestimate the net pressure. We will underestimate it. At that time, Schlumberger and other uh, companies that were supporting uh, the hydraulic fracturing consortium in Delft University, and they ran some tests there, the group of Hans de Bader. You just see a schematic of the test on, lar the, uh, on uh, large blocks, on strong rocks and weak rocks, strong rocks from cement, weak from plasters. And they had these systems with all the kind of monitoring devices, acoustic uh, transducers, pressure transducers. So they monitor the fracture as it, as it was propagating and closed. And I will show some of the uh, results. Actually, uh, yes, this, this is some of the results for the net pressure as the fracture propagates. And for the fracture width, as the fracture propagates, then the pressures are quite close. And even for soft blocks, it's lower. And the reason, as I, as I show in the results, when the fracture is wider, the, 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 the fluid front reaches closer to the teeth. And back at the bubble could be very closer, even lower at, as it shows here. But here you can see clearly that it's much wider, the fractures in the soft blocks. Now we need to be careful here, huh? because we need to compare the results for the same pumping time. And if you compare the results for the same pumping time, we will find that with plasticity, the net pressures are higher for the same pumping time. And now we will look at the closure in this experiment in stroke 
rock, let's say, the strong plaster, and weak rock, weak plaster. In the case of the strong rock, oh, you will see that when the pressure in the fracture drops near the confining stress on the block, the fracture had closed. You can see here in the red line that the fracture had closed. We are quite close. Now, if we go to the weak rock or weak plaster, you can see that when the pressure drops to the value of the confining stress, which is around here, the fracture is still open, widely open. And actually, it will close the fracture here at negative net pressure, at pressures lower than the confining stress. So again, we need to be very careful with interpretation of the mini flat in weak formations. The other thing which I forgot to mention, so if I allow me to go back a little bit here, when the, when the uh, fracture closes first near the tip, the proband near the tip will be under higher stress. And then it is a matter of equilibrium. The proband the back at the elbow will be under lower stress. So we need to be very careful with the closure stress on the proband. So, and this is one of the pictures actually from the Delft uh, Consortium, which show the fracture roughness in the weak plaster. And you can see in this case, in the area where the fracture was propagated, in the wet area and in the dry area, the fluid front uh, is here, the fracture tip here. You can see how rough is the surface probable due to uh, plasticity. Now, one of the applications that we wanted to do hydraulic fracturing in weak uh, rocks, it's for sound control. It's for sound control. And basically, the idea is that uh, if we do hydraulic fracturing, and, uh, and then allow the fracture to close on the proba, we redistribute the stresses. And with the stress redistribution, we decrease the shear stress. And this is what we see here. This is the stresses here before fracturing, far away ahead of the tip. It's like before fracturing. And then after we fracture, we are here. The stresses are here, and you see then became closer. And then this can be seen clearly in this diagram here, so which shows this, how close we are to the failure. Let's say that the failure line, which is defined by the rock strength, is the red line, and the blue line, it's the stress concentration, according to the more Coulomb, let's say. Now you can see, before fracturing, the stress state is very close to failure. Now, if we do hydraulic fracturing and allow the fracture to close on the proba, we push the stresses away from failure. So here, basically, we are just on the fracture surface. You can see that the stresses move away, far away from the failure line. And this is as we move to the distance perpendicular to the fracture surface, to the pro fracture surface. So far away, it's like not seeing the hydraulic fracture. But very close to the, the fracture, we push the formation away from failure. We extended this work by looking into the role of the pore pressure and the leak off in the formation as well and uh, so we look at also some of the sensitivity of the results on the on the fracture criteria of the cohesive model 
And just to say for uh, people that they do such modeling, the shape of the softening of this curve, it's not very important if it is linear or exponential. What is important, it's the area under the curve, which is, with the, which is equal with the strain energy release rate. We found also that the initial slope, the stiffness, could be important in hydraulic fracture. And some of the results with poro elastoplasticity, the solid line, the fractures are wider from the poro elasticity and the pure elasticity. The same tendency with the net pressures with poroelastoplasticity are higher compared to poroelasticity and elasticity. And of course, now we may have some practitioners here and they say, they may say, yeah, and uh, it's difficult to do, of course, finite element with plasticity, the problem is highly non-linear, fully coupled for the design purposes, purpose it's quite difficult. And then practitioner will say, what I can do to get my results closer to the results of plasticity. What I will advise for the practitioners is to use the unloading elastic modulus in the classical uh, hydraulic fracture simulators. The reason of using the unloading elastic modulus is because near the fracture tip, we have plasticity, but once the fracture propagates behind and loads elastically. So the bulk of the area is under unloading uh, mode. So to use the unloading elastic modulus, which is very close to dynamic modulus and actually quite easily available in the industry, petroleum industry, and to take care of plasticity with effective fracture targets. So to show that, I have the, one of the diagrams which shows the calculation of the effective fracture toughness with fracture length. So I will take the limit value here, and I will use this limit value in the elastic simulator, and then to compare the results with the full plasticity model. And this is what we did here in this diagram. The, the, the initial fracture toughness before propagation, the elastic fracture toughness, I will say, was two. And this was the prediction by the elastic model. If we use the effective fracture toughness, the limit value, the pressure profile is this one here, as you can see. No, actually, this is not the fracture profile. This is the, the, the fracture opening. Okay, this is the fracture opening. So this is with elasticity, elasticity with the effective fracture toughness, and with full plasticity. You can see here that the effective fracture toughness prediction is close to elasticity. And the same results we can get with, with the pressure profiles. The pressure profile predicted by the effective fracture toughness is quite close to plasticity. And I have another example where the, the effective fracture toughness in this time actually was 34. It was for much weaker material, much weaker material. So, so we got effective fracture toughness, 34 megapascal square meter. And then we use this elevated in the elastic modulus. I will say now on, on the top, we have the pressure profiles in the fracture, which is quite close again to plasticity. And in the lower, we have the fracture profiles, the fracture profiles. In this case here, we don't have a good matching as before. It's, uh, it's narrower, the plasticity near the tip. The reason is because the 
the model we used was full, it was full dilatant. Full dilatant means that the dilation angle in the plasticity model was equal with the friction angle. It was full dilatant. In reality, actually, the dilation it's lower than the friction angle. So if we have plasticity with dilation lower than friction angle, non-associative plasticity, as we call it, I believe the result will be closer. And uh, we tried with some analytic work to look at also the influence of the dilation of non-associativity. And we found that the non-associativity solution is between the elastic solution, solution and the solution we get for associative solids, for associative. So the non-associative is in between. One of the things we found with non-associativity is that it gives a kind of a boundary layer in the stress concentration near the fracture tip. And more recently, I, we did some calculation looking into the influence of the shear stress from the viscous fluid, of the shear stress loading from the viscous fluid. And again, we found some the difference it makes is in the emergence of these boundary layers in the stress concentration near the fracture tip. But I will not spoil it further. Let's go to more obvious things. And it's nice to have analytical models because in the analytical models, you can identify critical parameters. And we try to develop an analytical model to take into account uh, plasticity. And at that time with uh, Professor Atkinson, he retired from Imperial College now, he was always consultant to Schlumberger. We developed this model based on the dislocation theory. And with this model, we replace the distributed plasticity, you can see here, with super dislocations with super dislocations that are sitting in the center of the gravity and of course we had different conditions to satisfy in order to determine the location and the strength of the dislocation conditions to satisfy was the stress intensity factor at the crack tip to be equal with the toughness for propagating at the dislocation to satisfy the more Coulomb yield criteria. And also that the crack act to maximize the crack opening displacement. So with this analytical model, in some particular, particular cases, like small scale yielding, when the plastic zones are much smaller than the uh, fracture length and the fracture toughness is zero, it's possible to derive the equations in dimensionless form, as you can see here, for the length of the dislocation, the crack opening displacement, which is the strength of the dislocation, is delta actually, B is the strength of the dislocation, delta is the crack opening displacement, and there is the force, which is a good measure of energy to propagate a fracture. And here with this function, we can identify some critical parameters, which you will see more clearly in the results I will show next. So the first critical parameter actually, it's the a parameter you see here in the horizontal axis, the difference between the stresses along the pro fracture propagation minus the closure stress divided by the undrained cohesion of the material. So this is for frictionless or undrained analysis, let's say. And these are the parameters which I shown before, calculate all in this diagram. And uh, we have 
the solid lines for small scale yielding and the dashed line for large scale yielding. When the fracture propagates in the horizontal direction, the stress the stresses are closed, so we are in this area here. We can induce the fracture and propagates easily. If we are in highly stress anisotropy, we are around this area here, which is more difficult to propagate the fracture. We need increasing energy to propagate and induce a fracture. Similar results for the case of the cohesive frictional material. Now the critical parameter, it's a combination of the stress field as before and the rock strength. Now we have the cohesion, we have also the friction, but this is the critical parameter. Again, the case when the front propagates horizontal, it's here easily to propagate the fracture and to induce fracture. And when we move to this here, for propagation in the vertical direction, more energy, you see, increases dramatically to, to induce and propagate the fracture. And based on these results, actually, it's a, uh, we thought about to propose a new brittleness index or parameter, and there are defin many definitions actually in the literature. This is from a, a paper published by Rune Hoare in 2015 with different definitions. Some of the definitions are based on the stress strain curve, some of the dynamic measurements. And of course, we need to be very clear some of these definitions to not follow the expected trend, the formation to be more ductile under confining stress. So based on the results I showed before, we propose a new parameter to which can be used as a brittleness index, which is a combination of the stresses, but and the and the rock strength and the rock strength. In this, we have the cohesion and the friction. This is a new definition. And some of the applications which I mentioned before, to look at uh, in the risk of inducing hydraulic fractures during CO2 injections. So what basically I had shown is that it's more likely that the fracture will propagate horizontally, even in the absence of a stress barrier on the top and below, it's more likely that it will, it will propagate horizontally than vertically. So it's less risky. And if the fracture propagates horizontally, will have some positive effects. It will uh, uh, solve the wellbore ejectivity problems, which is a problem is CO2 injection. And also if the fracture propagates long, it will increase the storage capacity of the formations. And uh, the other thing we did, of course, the uh, CO2 injection due to the corrosive nature may change the material parameters. So we try to make a comparison using the analytical model, which I showed before, to compare the results when we have the risk of fracturing in the virgin material. And in the case when the, the rock strength was severely damaged due to the corrosive action of the CO2 injection. And in that case, actually, we decrease the rock strength, like the textile strength and the rock strength and the fracture toughness, the original fracture toughness, by 10 times. And then if we look at the results, 
the solid lines here are for the virgin material and the dashed lines are for the corrosive material. You can see here that even in the case of the corrosive materials, it's more difficult to induce hydraulic fractures. It's more difficult to induce hydraulic fractures in the case of the corrosive material. Uh, this is the prediction of the model. Actually, what it will take a more plasticity because the, the rock will be weaker and then it will shield the tip and it will not be possible to induce hydraulic fracture. Of course, there are other risks for the suit to escape, which will not address in this point here. But at least we see that, he, again, the, this is for frictionless, this is for frictional material, for fully frictional material. Even when we have the severe damage material due to CO2 injection, it will be more difficult to, for the CO2 to induce hydraulic fractures uh, and the CO2 to escape. Now, I make many times the point that it's very likely for the fracture to propagate in the horizontal direction rather than in the vertical. Of course, someone may say, but uh, look, if we propagate vertically, then the closure stress decreases. So it will be easier for the fracture to propagate uh, vertically as the closure stress e e decreases. Then I will, I try to do some comparisons here. So I started with definition of the net pressures, which the pressure in the fluid minus, minus the closure stress. And for the linear elastic fracture mechanics, the stress intensity factor is the net pressure this times the square root P times the half length of the fracture. We can write it like that within uh, replacing the net pressures and the fracture we will propagate when we reach the fracture toughness. So then I can solve for the pressure in the fracture, which is the closure stress plus the toughness divided by the square root of P times half the half of the fracture length. So this is the equation now. Now we know that the local stress gradient for the horizontal stress. It's around 50.8 kilopascal square meter or 0.7 psi per foot. So if, we, if the fracture propagates vertically upward, the resistance will decrease by 15.8 kilopascal per meter. But we will have the increase of the fracture toughness and this results which I shown before, show elevated fracture toughness of the order of 10 megapascal. I show you results of uh, before around 35 megapascal times square meter. And actually it doesn't need long propagation for the fracture to reach this value of the fracture toughness. So apparently here we are talking about megapascal, here is kilopascal. Of course, this we need to take into account the length of the fracture, but as I say, for uh, uh, it reaches the asymptotic value for very short propagation. So the conclusion is the fracture will propagate horizontally. Actually, now, if the fracture propagates horizontally, the closure stress does a change, and, and the resistance, the effective fracture toughness is smaller, as we say, smaller. So it's very likely that the fracture will prefer to propagate horizontally. Now, if I see the time, we are getting close to the time. Actually, the conclusions, I mentioned this many times, the role of plasticity as a shielding mechanism, decreases the effective fracture toughness. Uh, in short, it reaches limit value, depending on the propagation direction relative to the stresses. Uh, what else we show? 
higher net pressure, why the fractures with plasticity. We need careful interpretation of the mini frac for the to obtain the closure stress. We have good distribution of the stresses near the fracture tip and push away the formation from failure. The definition of the brittleness index, which is a combination, as I say, of the stress field, the rock strength. And I mentioned also the relative application in CO2 injection for uh, estimate the risk of CO2 escape through hydraulic fractures. I will close here. And uh, as I say, the presentation will be available. And uh, I will try also to answer question. Thank you very much for uh, listening to my presentation. Let me try to see the, the chat, how to find the... Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Pan Panos. While you are uh, looking for the uh, chat window and the find the answers, i just like to see that uh, um, yeah. This is a fantastic. I uh, have to say, um, 20 years ago, you enlightened me in this plasticity world. Yeah. And today, you did that again with this uh, fantastic presentation of hydraulic fracturing. This is uh, not I, only in depth, in depth, but also the coverage as well. Uh, I, thanks for, for, for sharing this. Thank you very much. I hope and, uh, I try to make it clear. I hope I managed to do it. Thank you. <laughs> you actually, the plasticity itself, as, as you know, much better than anybody else. It's such a complex uh, problem, but the, you always explain it in such a clear way that yeah. uh, for the folks uh, that can understand. And uh, yeah. before panels uh, answer the questions, I'd like, yes. like to uh, announce the next uh, rope talks uh, the, uh, next week. Okay, well, first of all, we, we, we have uh, uh, two more rope talks before we wrap up this uh, series. As I mentioned in the email uh, newsletter, the rope series has been tremendously helpful and successful, thanks to all the speakers and the participants too. Uh, but every good party has, uh, has ends. Uh, it doesn't mean the fun stops. We have uh, multiple events coming that actually uh, with, uh, with uh, excellent technical contents to entertain and engage the uh, technical communities. Um, but next week, we have uh, uh, Thomas Finkbell from uh, uh, COST uh, in, in Saudi Arabia uh, that are gonna share his uh, experience and studies in the in-situ stress. So that, uh, for the folks not familiar with, but uh, uh, the cost is one of the um, prestigious uh, technical research institute in Saudi Arabia. And you will hear more from Thomas next week. Um, but in you know the time, uh, panelists, feel free to take over uh, to answer some other questions. Uh, you probably with yeah. just a couple of them and we follow up with, uh, with the rest uh, uh, through the emails. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, I will try to answer as much as possible. And uh, if we don't manage with the time, then I can send you my uh, written answer. Uh, let's start with a, a question. Uh, the first uh, comment, it was about the presenter screen. I hope it wasn't any problem during my presentation. It's too late now anyway. I hope it was okay. The next uh, question by Suraj. Hi, Banos, thanks for excellent uh, presentation. What do you mean unloading? Uh, if that during the actual test base on my experience, it can be higher. Is that you propose? What I said is to use the unloading modulus. Actually, the unloading uh, modulus, it's quite close to the dynamic modulus, especially for small amplitudes, uh, as we had seen. And as the 
as the large formation, it's under a low thing, this is what I propose. Of course, if T is smaller than dynamic modulus, this is the role of plasticity as well, and we will take into account the plasticity with effective fracture toughness, which will uh, introduce in the model. In any way, let's put it that way. And dynamic modulus is the upper bound of their loading modules. I hope I'm clear. The second by Martin Haddad, to everyone, consider that the common fracture toughness measurement for the reservoir rocks using scratch test is values, uh, 1.7 megapascals square meter. Will you please explain the condition to obtain 35 megapascal? and uh, 20 times more. And uh, this is what we calculated. Huh? When, the, when you measure in the scr uh, scratch test, it's, the, it's not under confining or under uh, plasticity condition. To the contrary, I have sh shown the results of one of the papers uh, which had shown uh, an increase of the fracture toughness by five times and was still increasing at higher uh, pressures. In this model, which I presented, I didn't impose anything. If the material, if the rock was very strong, we will not get any increase in the fracture toughness. But if the material was weak, this is what we got in the calculations. Did you perform a sensitivity study on the dilation angle? How important is it to modify P net and fracture with? Actually, as I say, the less dilatant material, it's between the elastic and dilatant. So dilation, it may, lower dilation will get slightly narrower fracture, but plasticity, it will still be there. Huh? So it's, we need to separate dilation from plasticity, of course, okay? We can have full plasticity with less dilatant material as for rock. As I say, uh, what we know now is for less dilation, we are between elasticity and the full dilation model. From my friend that is Shepard, it's a long time to, to see him. Magde, you can measure toughness at confined strengths in rock lab. There are a number of papers published. Very nice, yes. I show one of those, yes. From Fushen Liu, in your experience, how large the plastic dissipation may be in terms of the energy budget compared with the elastic potential energy, fracture, surface energy, fluid viscous, dissipation, so on. As this is what I show, the measure for me of the energy dissipation was the effective fracture toughness, the elevated fracture toughness, which I, 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 did, I calculated. This is the measure of the dissipation of the energy. From Tom Bratton, ex-colleague, how might the analysis be different if the background formation is itself in a post-yield state? Uh, Tom Bratton means that the uh, post-yield state, post-yield state, what that means post-yield state, after, what I can think is that the, the formation is very close to plastic uh, yielding. To move away, of course, even if it is in a post yield state, the fracturing will bring it again to the yield state. So I hope I'm clear. Uh, from Chenko Lee, Panos Gritus from Minnesota Mafia, uh, and the compliment, huh? I have the compliment here. Thanks for the excellent talk. As a usual, I enjoy your presentation. Can we understand strange softening behavior in horizontal and vertical sample rock, respectively? Uh, 
as a displacement of the horizontal and vertical frag. Uh, it's not a matter of uh, uh, sample or rock orientation, but orientation with respect to the acidus stresses. Yes, you can investigate that with the applied in situ, different situ stresses, definitely. This is what we can do. So these are the comments. I don't see any other comment. Um, Excellent. Uh, I'm, I'm sure if, uh, um, if folks still have questions, um, panel's email will be in my newsletter. And feel free to send uh, panels your additional comments or compliments, especially compliments to panels. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and thank again, uh, panels. This is this is great. This is fantastic. Thank you, thank you for teaching us again. And uh, uh, and for the, all the rest of folks, uh, stay well and healthy. That's the most important thing we are doing. And uh, we will see you next week. Um, take care and, eat and uh, have a safe moment. Okay. All right. See you next week, panels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to take care, everybody. And I hope to see you soon. Yes. <laughs> I look forward. Okay. <laughs>